Welcome to ScrubCast, where we take a closer look at the research happening at Stanford University's Department of Surgery. I'm your host, Rachel Baker. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Carolyn Daisy Saad. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Rachel. I'm really excited to be here. You are an assistant professor in our Division of General Surgery's endocrine section. What is it about thyroids that gets you up in the morning? Well, as an endocrine surgeon, thyroids, parathyroids, and adrenal glands are all equally exciting to me and motivate <laughs> me to get to work every day. But, you know, when I was in training, I became interested in endocrine surgery because in this subspecialty, we're really able to have dramatic impacts on patients' lives by removing hormone-producing tumors, oftentimes through quite elegant, minimally invasive operations. Most of these are performed on an outpatient basis, which is really convenient for patients and often with really small incisions. So, you know, I felt like endocrine surgeons were really able to make people feel better and address a myriad of health problems with operations that are low risk and easy to recover from for most patients. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what got me interested to start. I like how you call them elegant. How are they elegant? You know, there. That's that's a good question. But um, you know, thyroid and parathyroid surgery we do through very small incisions in the neck, um, a place that's really visible to patients and to the people that they see. So our goal is to make the smallest incision that we can to accomplish our goal. So for say parathyroid surgery, you know, sometimes that's like a two centimeter incision to target a parathyroid adenoma and enlarged parathyroid gland. And our goal is to be as atraumatic as possible. We're trying to get in and get out um, with as little trauma and with the smallest incision we can. So to me, that comes out as elegant. Sure. I, I totally get that. It's amazing to me how something so small can have such a huge impact. Yes. And, and that's what really drew me to endocrine surgery to start. Not only that, you know, which is probably most notable for treating primary hyperparathyroidism, but also, you know, as endocrine surgeons, we treat cancers of endocrine glands that most commonly is patients who have thyroid cancer, which is a really treatable cancer with surgery um, that typically affects a younger patient population. So, you know, it's also quite rewarding to work um, with that patient population on the For disease sure. that we can make an impact on. Awesome. Well, so you were a first author on a recent study in Annals of Internal Medicine, which is not something we usually find our surgeons in, that looked at parathyroidectomy and kidney function. What did you find out there? Yeah, so probably good to give a little bit of background just because some listeners may not be totally familiar with the conditions we're talking For about. Sure, please do. So, you know, my research program is focused on how best to manage primary hyperparathyroidism you know, a condition in which one or more parathyroid glands overproduce parathyroid hormone, leading to too much calcium in the blood. And having this calcium in the blood can have adverse effects for patients, including osteoporosis leading to fractures, mm -hmm. kidney stones, neurocognitive symptoms, and declining kidney function. Um, and the only treatment for primary hyperparathyroidism is parathyroidectomy, a surgery to remove one or more abnormal parathyroid glands, um, which, you know, leads to normalization of the calcium levels. Mm -hmm. um, however, some people advocate for non-operative management of this condition, essentially, you know, really just watching and observing for disease progressions in patients oh. who don't have major symptoms. Gotcha. Um, and interestingly, the majority of patients with primary hyperparathyroidism don't have parathyroidectomy. They're followed mm -hmm. non-operatively, especially if they're older patients. Okay. So much of the research that I do is trying to understand the risks and benefits of parathyroidectomy you know, in patients of all ages, but especially in older adults, which is the group that's most commonly diagnosed with the condition. Should you cut? Should you not cut? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, that, that, that's, you know, often a question surgeons are having to deal with. And so getting back to your original question, back to this study in Annals of Internal Medicine, that study evaluated the effect of parathyroidectomy on long-term kidney function um, in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism using target trial emulation, okay. which is sort of a, a newer research method where we replicate a hypothetical randomized controlled trial using observational data um, wow. rather than spending millions of dollars recruiting patients and doing a study where we have to follow patients for a long time. Totally. 
So in this case, we use national data from the VA. And essentially what we did is we you know, limit the cohort of patients from that observational data to those who would have been eligible for operative management of their primary hyperparathyroidism and would have been considered eligible for a randomized trial if we were trying to compare um, mm -hmm. outcomes from parathyroidectomy and non-operative management. We then use some advanced biostatistical methods to sort of balance the characteristics in each treatment group. And then we compared um, the long-term timing and frequency of declining kidney function in each group on long-term follow-up. Okay. Um, and in this case, our primary outcome was a time to a 50% drop in your estimated glomerular filtration rate, which is a measure of kidney function. So we found overall that when we looked at the, the you know, total group with primary hyperparathyroidism, parathyroidectomy had no effect on long-term kidney function um, in just general adults of primary hyperparathyroidism. Oh, darn. But when we looked at subgroups of interest, you know, based on on age specifically, which was what was most interesting to us, um, we found that there was a benefit in patients younger than 60 ah. who were um, more likely to preserve their kidney function if they underwent parathyroidectomy. Okay, cool. But I'm imagining that there are some limitations to this, right? Like the VA study, that's got to be mostly guys, I imagine. And then, you know, looking at it just retrospectively, is there... Yeah, you, you hit on probably two two big things there. So one is, yes, this is a, a VA study. So it was, I think we had 90 to 94%, I can't remember the exact number, were male. Mm. We don't know reasons why we'd see differences in the effect on kidney function in men and women, mm. but it's certainly a limitation because probably about 70% of the population with primary hyperparathyroidism is female, yeah. not male. So that was one limitation. And the other thing is, yes, we are using observational data. So this is, you know, data that was not prospectively collected and we didn't perform a prospective randomized control trial. Mm -hmm. So there's always a chance of there being some residual confounding in the association that we saw. But, you know, a lot of the methods we used um, were really trying to uh, address all of those things and count for as much as we could uh, the differences between the groups. Got it. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you also, I was stalking you a bit, for, you know, after I asked you on the show, and I was like, what else has she written? Um, so there was another paper, JAMA Internal Medicine, another one that I don't read on the regular, um, <laughs> where you showed positive link between parathyroidectomy and a reduction in bone fracture. And that's the osteoporosis that you were talking about earlier? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, primary hyperparathyroidism, you know, that elevated parathyroid hormone levels, you end up leaching calcium from your bones and having it go into your blood and then get filtered by the kidneys. Um, so that over time leads to osteoporosis. And I will mention, just since you brought up the two journals that we're publishing in, you know, our, our goal in this research is to try and help patients make better decisions about the treatment of their primary hyperparathyroidism mm -hmm. and help clinicians who care for these patients make better decisions. And, you know, rarely are the gatekeepers for these decisions surgeons. Most mm -hmm. commonly, this is going to be primary care physicians or endocrinologists who are seeing these patients, diagnosing them with primary hyperparathyroidism, and then making the decision about whether to refer them to a surgeon. Right. Um, so we, we felt it was really important to you know, do good research, publish it in high impact journals, and make sure there are journals that endocrinologists and primary care mm -hmm. physicians read um, so it. that okay. they can benefit from this knowledge and, and you know, use it for counseling their patients. Oh, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. We looked at only older adults. So these were Medicare beneficiaries of primary hyperparathyroidism. Got it. And as you mentioned, we, we followed them for fracture outcomes. And we found that treatment with parathyroidectomy was associated with a lower rate of any fracture and hip fracture compared with non-operative management. And most importantly, we found this to be true among patients of all age groups, like up to, oh. you know, patients over 85, wow. all frailty groups, those with and without osteoporosis, men and women. So, you know, this really highlighted that treatment with parathyroidectomy leads to meaningful fracture, fracture risk reduction in older adults, primary hyperparathyroidism. So our sort of conclusions from that paper was that if your patient has a reasonable life expectancy, like mm. three or more years, it's probably best to manage them operatively for the sake of their bone health. Cool. Imagine I'm a patient and I'm seeing your one study that says, well, you know, kidney function really didn't show that big of a thing in older adults, but it showed a reduction in bone fracture. So 
I guess I'm seeing one that goes says no parathyroidectomy, one that says yes parathyroidectomy. Is there going to be more research? Yeah, so so it's a great question. So you know, as you said, there's sort of conflicting data on different outcomes. You know, the the, the real goal of of all of the research that my group does is. We want patients and clinicians to know what they're going to get from parathyroidectomy. Mm. What are the actual benefits going to be? Because yep. we can kind of hypothesize, given we know what problems primary hyperparathyroidism mm. causes, mm-hmm. we can hypothesize, oh, if we fix it, all those things are going to get better. Right. But really, until you prove it in research, you, you can't say that you know surgery is going to benefit either patients overall or specific groups of patients. Mm-hmm. So, you know, our takeaway from those two studies combined is that for older adults, you know, decisions shouldn't really be made taking kidney preser- kidney function preservation into account mm-hmm. because older adults don't really see those benefits after parathyroidectomy, but they really see benefits in terms of their bone health. So, you know, when a doctor is talking to a patient who's newly been diagnosed with primary hyperparathyroidism at say 70 or 75, they should say, you know, for parathyroidectomy, we're really doing this to preserve, you know, your bone strength and prevent fractures. Yeah. Even if you have some pre-existing kidney function issues, this probably isn't going to help that for you. Got it. I mean, knowledge is power, right? Yeah. And then, you know, we're doing some more research basically to see if we can um, create some prediction models Yay. so that we can look at an individual patient and sort of plug in all their specific Ooh. characteristics to understand, you know, what their individual risk of developing complications. Like a calculator? Exactly, calculator. You know, what, what their risk of complications from primary hyperparathyroidism are so that they can understand how surgery might help. And we're also doing interviews with patients and doctors to try and understand like what matters to patients when they are making these decisions mm-hmm. and what might be some barriers to surgical management. Quantitative plus qualitative, this sounds like an s study. Exactly. Mixed methods all the way (laughs) with the goal of eventually, hopefully getting to some kind of decision support tool that will help patients and and clinicians make better decisions when deciding between parathyroidectomy or non-operative management. Awesome. I love it. Looking back, I think most of this research was in part thanks to some funding you received from the National Institute on Aging. Is that correct? Yes, I have been very fortunate to be funded by the National Institute on Aging for both my K-76 Peace and Career Development Award, which I have right now, which is a five-year award, um, and before that, a GEMSTAR R03 award, which um, stands for Grants for Early Medical or Surgical Specialists Transitioning to Aging Research. The NIA is great. It's very focused on supporting early stage researchers to study how best to care for older adults. So I feel really lucky that I had mentors who clued me into the programs and grants that they offer for physicians of all specialties, including surgeons. Very cool. I mean, it sounds like a sweet deal. If I'm a young surgeon scientist, what advice would you give me so I could put myself in the best possible position to get one of these? Yeah, the, I would say the best advice that I got as an early investigator that, that helped me was, you know, that it's really important to pick a research focus that's relatively unique, mm. but that you are really, truly interested in and could see yourself working on for five to 10 years. Yeah. Because, you know, in order to be successful in getting a grant, such as a career development award, you know, you need a unique angle and also a body of work that shows you're knowledgeable or an expert on a topic and should be you know, the one to have money given to them to study <laughs> it more. And then you also need to have perseverance to keep applying until you get the grant that will allow you to pursue the research. So those three things are probably the most important. Awesome. I love that. You also received a visiting professor award from the Association of VA Surgeons this year. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Where are you planning to go? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I um, will be going to the Uni- University of Wisconsin at Madison for the AVAS visiting. And I will be able to give a Grand Rounds presentation cool. on my research there and meet with surgeons and researchers to discuss my academic and clinical work. So I'm really looking forward to it. Neat. But, um, so is AVAS, do we call it AVAS? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yes. Is is AVAS your association of choice? 
Um, it is definitely, it's one of many, you know, there are, <laughs> you know, lots of different associations for different aspects of like my career. So we've got, you know, hmm. endocrine surgery focused organizations like the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, of course, the American College of Surgeons. Mm-hmm. AVAS is a special community because, you know, I'm a VA surgeon and it's really nice to be able to go to a meeting where there are other clinicians and researchers who are also focused on sort of improving veteran surgical care. So it's a great meeting. And, and as you know, our chair, Dr. Khan, is the president of that association this year. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to go to the meeting next year. Awesome. Well, so we missed you at the Pacific Coast Surgical Association's annual meeting this year, but you had a pretty good excuse. Uh, you were busy becoming a first-time mom. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Thank it's you. very exciting. Yes. What is it like being an academic surgeon and wanting to start a family? It feels like you're already doing so much juggling clinical time and research, and then you're like, I'm going to add a baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, um, I mean, my husband and I have been thrilled to care for our son, Grayson, who's now three months old, who I had around the time of Pacific mm-hmm. Coast, you're right. And we had tried for a number of years to have children and ended up using a surrogate to have him. So we were especially excited when that worked out. Definitely, there were some challenges to dealing with, you know, infertility and family planning while being an academic surgeon. But, you know, I'm really lucky that I had a lot of support from my mentors and leadership in the department here at Stanford, including Mary Hahn, Sherry Wren, and Arden Morris. And I think in some ways, you know, having my research passion as a distraction as we worked through (laughs) all those issues was actually kind of helpful because... You know, no matter what, it would have taken a long time to get Grace in. So good to have a career you're interested in and and like, you know, while you're dealing with all those things. But I must say, based on my brief experience, it's been, you know, pretty amazing being an academic surgeon and a mom um, because I'm interested and inspired by what I do clinically and research wise, you know, during the days and excited to come home to him every night. So it's been really great. And wonderful. You know, with everything that I went through, I'd say, you know, in general, I'm just pretty open in my advice to trainees on this matter, which is Mm -hmm. plan ahead to preserve your fertility or Mm -hmm. think about, you know, when you might want to have kids um, and then, you know, move ahead with it whenever it feels right for you, because, you know, there's really never a perfect time to have a baby (laughs) probably in anyone's career. Right. But there's now a lot of support um, and surgery to let people make those decisions for themselves. and we can support them in that. It's wonderful to hear that. Anything else that we, I haven't asked you about that you want to talk about? We're just about out of time, unfortunately, but um, I want to always give my interviewees the opportunity, if you know you have a passion project on the side, to call it out, give it a shout out. Good question. Yeah. You know, I'd say probably, you know, as I said, most of my research so far has focused on primary hyperparathyroidism Mm -hmm. and I really liked doing kind of a deep dive and trying to say we're going to fix this problem and improve how we make treatment decisions for that condition but I've become really interested in you know surgical decision making for older adults in general and specifically a lot of people are researching you know how to help older adults make decisions about major surgeries Mm -hmm. where you know they're high risk and you know risk of functional decline, cognitive decline after surgery, all these complications. Um, But no one's really looking at trying to help people make decisions about low-risk operations Mm -hmm. like parathyroidectomy and thyroidectomy, which, you know, are, as we said, elegant short operations that are often (laughs) done in an outpatient setting. So, you know, I'm really trying to focus more on general surgical decision-making in different types of operations that have that risk profile and figure out how maybe we can create a tool that might help um, not just for a specific operation, but for this whole genre of operations and make it easier for older adults to sort through how they can make informed decisions about this. Neat. Well, I cannot wait to see it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure talking with you. It's been great. And that brings us to the end of another episode. If you like Scrubcast, we hope you'll tell your friends and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Scrubcast is a production of Stanford University's Department of Surgery. Today's episode was produced by Rachel Baker. The music is by Midnight Rounds. 
and our chair is Dr. Mary Hahn.